Good evening. I'm delighted to speak on behalf of MUFG as we once again sponsor IPA's annual infrastructure ovation. I'm joined tonight by Head of Project Finance, Robert McIsaac, and the Head of Advisory, Rob Ward, along with many of our 35 strong team in infrastructure. This is the fifth year we've sponsored the ovation as MUFG, and as uh, uh, Brendan pointed out, the 11th year uh, as a team, and we enjoy a close relationship with the IPA. Uh, I congratulate Brendan and the team on the recent rebranding of IPA and its new website, and I can guarantee that IPA had a bigger budget for their branding than we do at MUFG. I'm still explaining to people what MUFG stands for, so I will take this opportunity of this sponsorship to note that uh, Mitsubishi UFJ Financial Group, MUFG, is our listed holding company and our global brand. Uh, our licensed bank here in Australia is the Bank of Tokyo Mitsubishi UFJ, but we operate under that global brand, MUFG. I hope that's clear. Uh, at MUFG, we've had a very busy year in 2016 across the infrastructure sector, closing more transactions than ever before, uh, reaching fourth place on the PFI league tables here in Australia, uh, and Global Bank of the Year for PFI uh, across, uh, across the globe in project finance. Uh, as you uh, will see on some screens early, uh, later this evening, we've provided significant balance sheet support to major privatisations like Ausgrid and Port of Melbourne, and acted as both advisor and lender on PPPs such as Capital Metro and the Northern Territory Secure Facilities Refinancing. We've also arranged two Samurai loans to help DBGNP and United Energy to access regional Japanese bank funding. Uh, in just the last six months, we've closed eight renewables deals, including as debt structuring advisor and underwriter for the demerger of Tilt, as well as supporting AGL, QIC and the Future Fund in the establishment of PATH. We're looking to close half a dozen more renewables deals just in the next few months. And this flurry of activity in the energy sector is very much driven by policy settings by government, which brings me to tonight's speaker. Until very recently, Professor Gary Banks was Chief Executive and Dean of the Australian and New Zealand School of Government, or ANSOG, a position he held for four years. As those of you from the public sector might know, ANSOG was established in 2002, and it developed innovative research and educational programs in close collaboration with their 10 government partners and 15 university and business school partners. It's no doubt due to Gary's leadership skills that ANSOG has continued to flourish, despite the challenges of corralling so many governments and academic institutions. I personally attended the Partnerships in Infrastructure course run by ANSOG. I was just talking to Gary about it uh, before. Uh, although of the 40 participants at that course, I was the only one from the private sector. So I felt a little like a poacher at a gamekeeper's convention. It's probably the opposite feeling that Gary has. He's an independent director at Macquarie Group. Um, prior to his role as ANSOG, Gary was chairman of the Productivity Commission from its inception in 1998 until 2013. He's headed national inquiries on a variety of significant public policy and regulatory topics. Most not notably for the infrastructure industry, he chaired the COAG Steering Committee for the Review of Government Services. For several years, he also had responsibility for overseeing the Commonwealth's regulation-making processes through the Office of Regulation Review and its successor body, the Office of Best Practice Regulation. Now, in 2012, his last year at the Productivity Commission, he was included by the AFR as one of our 25 true leaders of the country and in the Australian newspaper's top 50 politically influential Australians. In 2007, he was made an office, Officer of the Order of Australia for services to the development of public policy in microeconomic reform and regulation. Gary continues to chair the Regulatory Policy Committee of the OECD, a post he's held since 2012. Looking across the policy frameworks of countries from Australia to Japan, Sweden, Estonia, Chile, so to hear his thoughts about how Australia is performing against its international peers, please welcome tonight's orator, Professor Gary Banks. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jeff. It's, it's an honour to have been invited to deliver the IPA's infrastructure ration for 2017 at such a, an auspicious event. Well, there's no shortage of issues of relevance to infrastructure about which one could orate in these interesting times. My intention until a few weeks ago had been to focus mainly on the economic side, infrastructure's important contribution through productivity growth uh, to raising the living standards of all Australians. I was going to remind you of the gains from the structural reforms of the 1980s uh, and 90s and what it took to get them. And I'd intended to then revisit the to-do list I compiled in 2012, at the end of my 
tenure at the uh, Productivity Commission uh, to see how it was faring five years on. Now, some of you may recall the list was prompted by a remark by Glenn Stevens, who, when asked at a summit in Brisbane what could government do to raise Australia's productivity, replied, well, the Productivity Commission has a long list of things to do. Go get the list and do them. This caused a bit of confusion among journalists present as to the existence of an actual list. <laughs> the RBA governor meant, of course, that the Commission had produced reports over the years uh, with recommendations yet to be implemented, um, but the resulting clamour seemed worth capitalising on. The list turned out to be quite long. The infrastructure section included recommendations for better decision-making processes, governance arrangements, pricing and regulation, along with other specific reform proposals for transport, communications, water and energy. Their common message to governments could be summarised most simply as a need for better spending, regulation and management of infrastructure services with greater reliance on market incentives. Well, it quickly became clear in revisiting this to-do list that its relevance had not diminished. On the contrary. For example, in a 2014 report, the Productivity Commission identified a still urgent need to overhaul processes for assessing and developing public infrastructure and to reform its governance, including further privatisation of assets where this had already proven beneficial. In its 2016 plan, Infrastructure Australia called for better planning and coordination, investments based on evidence-based priorities, along with better management of existing assets, including through private ownership and cost-reflective pricing of services. And of course, Infrastructure Partnerships Australia continues to be a strong advocate for all of these things and more. As a number of reports have shown, policy issues of relevance to infrastructure extend well beyond infrastructure policy as such. Other sections of the to-do list that, if addressed, would enhance the performance of economic and social infrastructure include reforms uh, to achieve more flexible labour market arrangements, a less distorting and punitive taxation system, and more efficient regulation in key areas such as planning and zoning and the environment. While developing remarks along these lines, my train of thought was repeatedly diverted by the unfolding energy crisis. Even by today's standards, the misleading, disingenuous and partisan nature of the energy policy debate seem to have plumbed new depths. So be it, I thought, it's no longer my job to call out such things. But then a straight premier went and made the following observation, and I quote, we've got market failure. We know there's an investment strike. The private sector just isn't building power generation. I must confess that this took the wind out of my sails, if you'll pardon the analogy. <laughs> the electorate was being told by a political leader that the problems they were experiencing, high prices, failing supply and costly emergency measures, had nothing to do with the government. It was the fault of the private sector and its perverse refusal to invest in power generation. Abraham Lincoln's warning that governments can't fool all of the people all of the time is once again being tested. The inconvenient truth is that increasingly high prices for increasingly unreliable electricity are a direct consequence of increasingly high utilisation of renewable energy required by government regulation. Now, energy markets are admittedly complicated things. However, the logic is unassailable that if a cheap and reliable product is penalised, while expensive and less reliable substitutes are subsidised, the latter will inevitably displace the former. No amount of sophistry, wishful thinking or political denial 
can change that basic economic reality. Changing the mix of energy use away from low cost but emissions heavy fossil fuels has of course been the whole point. While Australia's own actions can have no discernible impact on global carbon emissions, let alone on Australia's climate, there is broad support for the idea that playing our part is a precondition for a joint international endeavour that could. This requires a leap of faith, but it's a legitimate policy objective, even if a particularly costly one for this country given its resource endowments. The resulting costs and difficulties have been greatly compounded, however, by governments choosing a policy path that is essentially anti-market, one violating basic principles of demand and supply. The energy crisis is self-evidently not the result of market failure, but of government failure. The 18th century literary sage Samuel Johnson remarked that, and I quote, a man is never more innocently employed than when engaged in making money. The actions of private investors are not hard to understand. They'll generally not invest in a project unless the returns are likely to be sufficient to cover the costs and provide an adequate return on their capital, given the risks involved and the alternatives on offer. Following regulatory interventions, returns from fossil fuel generators have gone down, while the risks of investing in them have gone up. I suppose the consequent reluctance to invest could be called a strike, if one needed an emotive term, but it's really just a rational response to the forces at work. Unlike government enterprises, private companies cannot be relied upon to provide for a government's uh, pride cover for a government's policy mistakes. In that light, the South Australian Treasurer's lament that privatising ETSA was the worst policy blunder in the history of South Australia may not only have been a big call, but more revealing than intended. <laughs> not to be outdone, the new Secretary of the Australian Council of Trade Unions has triumphantly declared that, and I quote, experiments in privatisation have failed. Well, in blaming the private sector for Australia's energy problems, and I note the new ACCC inquiry into alleged misdemeanours by electricity retailers, there's a real risk that the policy mistakes that led to it will be compounded by further policy mistakes rather than leading to corrective actions that acknowledge regulatory error. We seem destined to end up in a third or fourth best world, as economists express it, rather than the first or second best, which were well within reach. Thus, we observe at the federal level the threat of regulatory intervention to withhold gas exports for domestic use, while at the same time, state and territory governments ban or curtail exploration and production. We even see governments re-entering the energy business South Australia is to spend a lazy half billion on a new gas generation plant. The Commonwealth's contemplating investing in clean coal generation using its $5 billion Northern Infrastructure Fund. The minister responsible declaring, the only people who could get rid of sovereign risks are the sovereigns. And while finance has never been scarce for viable energy projects in the past, the government is now planning to fill the gap caused by regulation through the previously derided Clean Energy Finance Corporation. Moreover, it's proposing to establish a more general infrastructure financing vehicle within the Prime Minister's own department, which a recent IPA submission by Brendan Lyon depicts as, and I quote, solving the infrastructure problem we don't have and ignoring the one we do. Then there was the dramatic announcement of a nation-building expansion of the tri-governmental snowy scheme that had been rejected as uneconomic in the 80s. Whether or not this utopia-like initiative can be justified on today's numbers, it seems clear that any thought of privatising such a politically attractive asset has become a thing of the past. <laughs> 
To add to the irony, we are seeing a new wave of interventions to help the very firms which emission reduction policies were intended to drive out of business. The Portland aluminium smelter, perhaps the most intensive user of electricity in the country, an operation requiring heavily subsidised power even when power was cheap, has received substantial additional taxpayer support to help forestall the inevitable. And following belated recognition of the implications of the closure of the Hazelwood Power Station in Victoria, there was considerable pressure on the federal government to deploy taxpayers' funds to keep it open. While this did not eventuate, it would be surprising if the country's other baseload generators did not have claims for assistance bolstered as a result, especially given the precedent in Europe. The intervention spawned by the failure of carbon policy accordingly looks to become a self-perpetuating process. It is disturbingly reminiscent of the conventional industry protection dynamic of times past, in which assistance to import competing firms impose costs on downstream users and exporters, who in turn demanded and often received assistance of their own. In the end, it became apparent even to supposed beneficiaries of the system, that protection all round was a chimera, responsible instead for a decline of industry performance and in the living standards of Australians. More disturbing still is the fact that such interventions have not been confined to energy markets with bad old policy habits re-emerging more widely. The headline act in this respect would have to be the NBN, which continues to affirm the wisdom of doing the numbers before announcing the policy. Then there's the saga of our homemade submarines, which seems set to rival the Collins class fiasco, but at even higher cost. Coastal shipping and its heavily unionised workforce continue to benefit from the renewal of anti-competitive regulation at the cost of farmers and miners. Meanwhile, on the trade front, the anti-dumping regime has been made even more protectionist in a rare instance of bipartisan agreement, and future reductions in our trade barriers have become contingent on reciprocal offerings by foreign governments, rather than for the domestic gains on offer. On the positive side of the ledger, throwing good money after bad at the local assembly operations of foreign car companies seems finally to be drawing to a close. While some new claimants for taxpayer support, such as Qantas, um, were successfully resisted. But the balance of policy weight has tipped decidedly the other way. Perhaps of most concern is the fact that there's been little or no progress in the policy areas likely to yield the greatest gains. Industrial relations reform became another no-go area following the ill-judged work choices episode. This contributed to a change of government in 2007 that soon saw an anachronistic regime and its associated costs reinstalled. As you know, the Productivity Commission inquiry was finally launched in 2015 with the admirable intention of bringing an evidence-based case for reform to the next election. This did not transpire and the Commission's relatively modest recommendations have been almost wholly neglected, despite unprecedented attention to the politics in framing them. In the case of taxation, the vision of the Henry Review and subsequent white paper process for an integrated suite of systemic reforms, collectively yielding gains of up to 3% of GDP, has been blindsided by clumsy attempts at piecemeal changes that have either been reversed like the RSPT or the MMRT, or heavily compromised, such as corporate tax. Meanwhile, the GST remains the dog that hasn't barked, or at least not for long. Whereas on the minor matter of the backpack attacks, lay, uh, Parliament laboured mightily to produce a mouse. Reforms to social and other government spending programs have also been thin on the ground. Welfare changes to reduce disincentives to engage in training and work are needed for their own sake, but would also help fiscal repair and potentially free up funds for productive uses, including infrastructure. 
Instead, key proposals have languished or been rejected out of hand. Then there's the spectacle of billions of dollars of new money being wasted in such programs as the now infamous vet fee help, family daycare, and rental affordability schemes, all of which were plagued by corruption and failed in terms of their own stated objectives. Meanwhile, a truly innovative uh, an important national reform to help people with profound disability has been jeopardised by weakened eligibility criteria and the truncation of trials essential to its financial sustainability. It also has to be said that despite the good work of Infrastructure Australia and its state counterparts, scarce public funding for infrastructure continues to be directed at areas of low economic but high perceived political payoff, such as expensive greenfield rail projects spanning regional electorates up the East Coast. Well, given more time, I could give you more examples. <laughs> but I think I might have made my point. Public policy development in Australia over recent years has been a sorry spectacle, with the energy imbroglio merely the latest instalment. Now, there are countries for which dysfun policy dysfunction is pretty much the normal state of affairs. Think Africa, Latin America, or countries in Europe like Greece, or dare I say it, France. But that has not been the Australian experience, at least not since the program of structural reforms commenced some three decades ago. Reforms that contributed greatly to the prosperity that we have since enjoyed. Before then, as many can hopefully still recall, Australia's policy experience wasn't too different from those other countries, with sectional interest trumping the public interest, turning bad policies into good politics. Keating's famous remark, about the Banana Republic resonated so strongly for a reason. The transformation of Australia's economic performance from the 1980s did not occur by accident or good luck. It involved a deliberate strategy based on an understanding by political leaders that good process, sound public administration, and effective political advocacy were essential in making a case for reform that would gain broad support. These prerequisites for good policy and its acceptance as such have been manifestly lacking more recently and the public's trust in government, any government, has sunk to all time lows. For example, only 31% of 6,000 respondents to the respected Mapping Social Cohesion Survey last year agreed that one could, and I quote, trust government to do the right thing most of the time, 31%. And in a separate and earlier poll, 62% of respondents said they would not trust government to manage tax reform. A loss of trust in government's hardly surprising when citizens have witnessed major policy initiatives appearing out of the blue, programs announced before they're agreed or even fully thought through, key stakeholders not being consulted, and reversals to previous policy positions occurring without justification or explanation. So why has this happened? More importantly, what can be done about it? One thing seems certain, maintaining the current policy traje trajectory is not an option, at least not if we wish to sustain high living standards for our burgeoning and ageing population. Well, it's becoming commonplace to lay blame for policy dysfunction on the advent of the new media, with its pursuit of around-the-clock content, its love of conflict, and its intolerance of deliberation and delay. One can readily see how it's contributed to the greater emphasis on spin, on tactics over strategy, and the short term over the long term. It seems also to have contributed to the new oppositionist politics in which any initiative by an incumbent government is steadfastly opposed as a matter of course, almost regardless of merit. 
Points of agreement with one's political adversaries can expect no media coverage while opposing claims not only get an airing, they face little risk of detailed scrutiny, no matter how fallacious. Oppositionism has been compounded by the rise of a new breed of independents in the Australian Senate who revel in the chance to shape policy rather than merely review it, but have demonstrated little capacity for comprehending where the national or even state interest truly lies. However, there are other developments within government itself which, in my view, have weakened its capacity to handle these changes. Ministerial staffers have traditionally played a key role in turning good policy into good politics, with experts from each domain playing a part. But officers have become increasingly populated by young people with political career aspirations of their own and are concerned mainly with issues management. The displacement of policy grunt with tactical flair has unfortunately coincided with this youthful cohort having a bigger say in what passes for policy development itself. This is brilliantly lampooned in the two ABC TV series, The Hollow Men and Utopia, which the government insiders often see more like documentaries than fictional comedy. <laughs> At the same time, the ability of the public service to hold its own by ensuring in time-honoured fashion that political decisions can be adequately informed by analysis and evidence has been seriously eroded. Systemic changes to enhance the responsiveness of the bureaucracy to the government of the day have succeeded all too well in many cases. Politically aligned appointments and tenuous tenure seem to have taken their toll on the free and frank advice that governments and the public need as opposed to the advice that a particular minister or leader may want. This has been compounded by a serious loss of analytical firepower in departmental ranks, to the point where even the ability to quality control the offerings of the ubiquitous consulting firms is often lacking. Well, a former federal minister once disarmingly declared in humorous fashion to a large assembly of public servants, and I quote, when we make our own mistakes, we need them to be well informed. Now this seemed to me at the time a perfect encapsulation of the relationship between minister and public servant, and it still does. That it's no longer happening to the extent that it should has heightened the political proclivity for policy error, especially under pressure from vocal interest groups or social media. Recent independent reviews of the Pink Bats, NBN and East West Link misadventures have all found the public service missing in action or worse. I'd suggest that the environmental policy failures behind the energy crisis constitute another example. In short, while reform uh, has no doubt become more challenging today compared to the reform era, recent experience has convinced me that the capacity of government to prosecute it has actually declined. Restoring the core capabilities of the public service and establishing a more productive relationship between office and department are, in my view, preconditions for getting policy back on track. So I'll end this oration with a few items from a new to-do list to that end. For a start, ministers need to authorise or reauthorise public servants to provide the comprehensive advice needed for properly informed decisions. Recent history tells us that failure to appreciate the trade-offs inherent in different policy choices can yield unintended consequences in political as well as policy terms. Arguably, more than one leader has lost office as a result. It would also help if every ministerial office had at least one senior staffer with strong policy credentials and some experience of government. And the reliance of focus groups to identify and test policy ideas needs to be abandoned in favour of broad and transparent consultation. For their part, departments need to re-establish a culture of ideas and respect for evidence, and they need to restore critical mass in policy analysis rather than contracting out 
their core business. They should also be more proactive in assessing issues and developing options, including by taking advantage of existing due process provisions for screening regulatory proposals. Above all, they need to hone the neglected craft of speaking truth to power. Well, despite my intention to speak about the economics of infrastructure, I've ended up talking mainly about the politics that surround it. This is because I have become convinced that the biggest challenge we face in public policy today is no longer knowing what to do, which can be difficult enough, but how to get it done. The obstacles in contemporary politics and media have undoubtedly increased, but these are reflective of underlying changes in Australian society and are unlikely to change. The only path to the, whole, to the policy high ground lies within executive government itself and the restoration of capabilities that served us so well in the past. I'm sure we'd all agree that this is ultimately a matter of leadership, but is that really too much to ask? Thank you very much.